Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are busy with uh, chapter 8 on internal forced convection. Uh, we've looked at the beginning of the chapter, you know, why is internal forced convection important. We've looked at the problem of how do we get an average temperature distribution inside a tube. We've looked at the entrance effects, the boundary layer thickness, which influences the friction factor, and the thermal boundary layer th uh, thickness, which influences the heat transfer coefficient. And the Prandtl number determines which one of the two is going to be firstly fully developed. Okay. Then we've looked at laminar flow in general, We've looked at turbulent flow, but we also did a special analysis, I think it was chapter 8.4, paragraph 8.4, where we specifically looked at the two important cases of a constant heat flux and a constant wall temperature. Okay. And the last part of the chapter, 8.6, we didn't have enough time with the previous lecture to finish it, so what I would like to do is just finish it quickly. So, in paragraph 8.6, you will firstly see that there are a number of equations that can be used for turbulent flow in tubes. It starts first by giving a friction factor, which uh, has been, and this equation has been developed by Petakoff, which typically can be used in some of these equations. However, the fine print in all this is very important. Please never use these equations like this. So, in your textbook, there are some very important words that you need to underline and when you do the selection that you need to take into consideration. For example, you'll see that this friction factor equation is only valid for a certain Reynolds number range. Okay. So, now the first equation almost 80 years ago was developed by Chilton and Colbin and this is the chilton colbin equation. So you can see getting the Nusselt number you must first get the friction factor and you need the Reynolds and the Prandtl number and then you can get the heat transfer coefficient from the Nusselt number. And then with the same data set people like Colbin developed an easier equation, this one 0.23 Reynolds to the 0.8 and Prandtl to the third. And then Dietus and Boulter which is now known as the dietz boulter equation, developed this equation. And you can see it is almost the same as that one, 0.23 Reynolds to the 0.8, but now a small adjustment for the Prandtl number. And what they recommended is that this equation works better if N is equal to 0.4 when you do heating and N 0.3 when cooling is being done. Okay. Then Sider and Tate develop this equation. Okay, and you'll see that there are similarities, but now we've got this term in here. Okay. Again, if you look at the fine print underneath the equation or at the equation, you will see that this equation has been developed where there are huge temperature differences between the wall and the bulk. Okay. So normally, high heat fluxes. If the heat flux is very, very high and there are high temperatures between the wall and the bulk, then you use this equation. Now the question is what is high? And that is always a problem that you're going to have when you, when, you, when you look at this. Well, it is actually very easy. So what you're going to do is you're going to look at what is the viscosity going to be on the, on the, uh, of bulk and what is it going to be on the surface. That ratio, if that ratio is approximately one, then this is not going to have an effect. But if this ratio is 0.5 or something like that, then obviously it's going to have a huge effect. So then this equation is the right equation to use rather than those equations. So that is how you will be led with all these equations in terms of making a decision. Again, and I didn't put it in because of the space limitations, is that all these equations are valid in a certain Reynolds number range and in a certain Prandtl number range. And they are given there. So please take note of them. Then the Petikoff equation was also based on the same data set and then lastly in the Glinsky equation which was developed in 1976. There are a few revisions on it but this is considered as the most accurate equation so far. So these are the equations that are available. Now a few things that I need to say about these equations. Firstly, they are not sensitive. So they are not sensitive for different boundary conditions, how we do the heating and or cooling. 
So if we look at previously where we had a constant heat flux okay, and a constant wall temperature, and they differed in terms of their characteristics, with turbulent flow, they are not sensitive. So it doesn't matter if it's a constant wall temperature, if it's a constant heat flux, all these equations can be used for that. So I think that is one of the first things that I would like to point out. Then you will also see that there is a special note for liquid metals. So for liquid metals, it needs to be treated a little bit different. The Prandtl numbers are very small. Again, there are special equations for them to be used. Then in the textbook, there is also a specific note on flow in the transitional flow regime. Okay, and Professor Gajar from Oklahoma State University, he did put in some of his graphs there of typical what happens in the transitional flow regime. It is very dependent on the type of inlet that you use uh, and many other boundary conditions. But in general, you can go and look, if you want more information on it, you can go and look at the work of Gajar and also the work that we did, Meyer et al., Meyer and Ulithir, etc., uh, Meyer and Everts, uh, coming, etc. So there's a huge body of work that we've done at our, in our labs also over the past few, past few years for flow in the transitional flow regime, if you want the friction factor and the Nusselt numbers for that. Then there's also specific equations to be used for rough tubes. Okay, when tubes are rough. Okay. Now, when are tubes rough? Well, this is one of the surprises that I got myself when we started working with, with this problem. All the tubes, I, I promise you, all the tubes that you can buy these days are smooth tubes. So you can, you can use that. Rough tubes will be, you know, when they are huge, when there's lots of fouling or in very specific cases. But in general today, it's very difficult to get rough tubes. In the old days when it was casted, tubes were rough. But these days they are very smooth. The only case when you will have to take the roughness into consideration is when, remember, when the diameter starts becoming very, very small. Then the surface roughness plays a role. Although the surface might be smooth, that this relative ratio starts becoming, becoming more significant. Okay, so rough tubes, there's special, a special note on that. Then non-circular tubes. If the tube is non-circular, in the beginning of, the, of this chapter, we've looked at different types of geometries. And what it suggests here is that you can just use the hydraulic diameter, which we've defined as four times the cross-sectional area divided by the perimeter. And if you use that, then you can go and calculate the Reynolds number based on the hydraulic diameter, and you can get the friction factor based on the hydraulic diameter. And then you're going to do exactly the same. The Nusselt number that you then is going to calculate will be based on the hydraulic diameter of the Reynolds number. Okay. And you're going to get the heat transfer coefficient like that. The diameter, the hydraulic diameter divided by K. So that is what you're going to do if you do not have good data on a specific non-circular tube and there's no equations available. Then the other category of problem is flow through an annulus. Flow through an annulus. So if you've got flow, and we are going to do examples like that, and let's suppose this is solid. Okay, and the flow flows through the annulus in between the two tubes. Okay. Uh, for those cases, there is an A value that is typically defined as that diameter, the inside diameter divided by the outside diameter. Okay. And there are different approaches that can be followed for this type of problem. The first approach that you can do is you can just say, well, let's go and calculate the hydraulic diameter. That's the first one that you can do. But you will also see in the textbook in table 8.4, some values are given that you can use. Not a lot, so just very limited information. Now what is always important to take into consideration here 
is where does the heating and cooling occur? Because in some cases it can actually occur on the outside wall, in some cases it can be there. Or one of the walls can be adiabatic, which means it has been insulated typically, and all that would influence what is happening in the annulus. So if you go and look at the work of Derker and Meyer, so Professor Derker was one of my undergraduate students, he did his masters with me, and his masters was specifically on this project, and since then we've been working on it for a long time. So there's a huge body of knowledge, huge body of literature available if you're interested in that. Take note just for refinement. Okay. So for this course for tests and exams, you can just use the textbook as is. Then Another body of work which is not in your textbook, again because it is just too much, is tubes where we have what we call heat transfer enhancement. Heat transfer enhancement. Okay. And these are tubes where typically on the inside uh, there are fins. Okay, my sketch is not so good, but you get the idea. And there are hundreds of different types of geometries available. Together with that, there are actually also tubes available in which we have also done some work, which are called micro, uh, uh, micro types of tubes, micro fins, typically in a uh, 8 to 12 diameter tube. There would be 80 fins on the inside, and their height is just about 0.4 millimeters. But these fins do not just run in a longitudinal direction, they are being rotated, like in a rifle. Okay. So it means that the fluid obviously has more area, so the idea is to give more area for heat transfer, but in many cases also to initiate more flow and or turbulence in the flow. So this is a whole body of knowledge on heat transfer enhancement. I've drawn these fins on the inside. In some cases you can get it on the outside. Okay, so you can also get it on the outside. It doesn't have to be on the inside. And there are tubes available where you have fins on the inside and the outside. Okay. Now, let's look at a case where and some of you might be familiar with it, uh, of a chiller, where you've got many tubes like that, can be actually a hundred of them. Later on I'm going to discuss it in more detail. So there are the tubes there, typically, and then the flow of water would typically go through there. Okay. And here on the outside you will have a refrigerant boiling. Okay. Now if you would like to do heat transfer enhancement in this case, would you put on fins and if so on what side? Would you do it on the outside or the inside or would you put it on both sides? Mr. Lowe. Why? To give more zero because it's a gas exchange in place. Okay, okay. So what we have in this case is, remember in this case we have boiling on the outside. Okay, it means that if we look at a single tube, then we have three terms there. Okay, okay. And because it's boiling, it means this temperature of the wall is constant, but this heat transfer coefficient is very high. So the resistance on the outside is directly proportional to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside and the area on the outside. Okay. And here is on the inside, exactly the same. Okay. Now, if you have boiling, then the heat transfer coefficient is in the order of magnitudes of tens of thousands, 10,000, 20, 30,000. It means that this resistance is extremely small. And here you will have water, so typically in a chiller you cool water from 20 to 10 degrees. Okay. And this heat transfer coefficient is of a single phase fluid, so typically order of magnitude a thousand. Okay. 
So if you look at this problem, then you'll see most of the resistance is actually on the inside of the tube. So for these cases, you'll put the fins only on the inside. Outside is not going to help. Okay. So there's logic in many cases when you put in fins. It is, just, it is not just a design decision to put them in. You can waste a lot of money if you, just, if you do not think of, of those resistance terms. Right. In terms of the theoretical lecture, ladies and gentlemen, any questions? In terms of ending this chapter. Please, it is important that you go and read this, in, this data, this information or this paragraph very well because in the test and exams there's not going to be time for you to go and look at all the details and make sure. So please make sure you go through it very well. Thank you very much.